Well, I'm not going to give a plenary address. I, I couldn't. And I think, actually, that um, uh, nearly all the, most of the papers we've heard, and particularly the last two, have actually provided a plenary address. So I just want to make a, a couple of remarks. I haven't got any PowerPoints. Um, and uh, then, then I think we might um, just have a few final questions before uh, toasting um, the new volume outside with a glass of wine. So when Matt and I um, uh, came up with the idea of this meeting, we, we felt that the Paleolithic community uh, hadn't really come together to talk about these sorts of issues and to go beyond the immediate Paleolithic community, to involve curators, to involve those involved in the planning process, uh, the national agencies, uh, contract archaeology, and so on. Uh, we haven't done that for a long time. We have the wonderful Palmiso Day, but that tends to talk about uh, results, quite rightly. Uh, so we were concerned uh, about this, and uh, with uh, everything being in a state of change, and our colleagues from Heritage England will confirm that the, that the you know, change is the norm, um, that uh, we, we felt that there needed to be a kind of wider overview. So we started off with those two questions which we thought that, uh, that the Paleolithic needed to investigate, which was how can we protect what we do not understand? This is very... I think we were in a kind of Donald Rumsfeld moment here um, about, you know, the knowns and the unknowns and the knowns that are not known and so on. But how can we protect what we do not understand? Uh, and we've heard a lot about that today. Uh, and uh, the, I think the, uh, uh, the, the overriding view there is uh, that we can answer that question through further research uh, and also a very frank understanding of what we don't know. And our second was, uh, how can we uh, understand that un unknown uh, in, uh, in greater detail? And we've talked a lot about uh, methodologies and David's uh, uh, examples from France, I think, were extremely important in, in showing us that we're not alone uh, in this uh, and that there are other ways, albeit perhaps slightly different geologies, and, of course, different traditions of research into these periods which allow us to do that. So that I think uh, in, 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 in asking the antiquaries to host this organisation, uh, to, 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 to host this particular event, that was our hope, that we would actually provide a forum again for bringing the Paleolithic together uh, and for uh, pushing some of these ideas forward, or at least you know, putting, pu pu testing the temperature of those particular waters. And this was something that I don't think we ever really did uh, in those research frameworks documents. And uh, I was involved uh, in several of them. Uh, and uh, we did have very large meetings, I seem to remember, uh, but not as big as this. And we uh, aim to be inclusive, uh, and hence, you know, there are 101 particular topics that people would like to like to have seen uh, impacted. And there, I, I would agree with uh, uh, the new uh, approach that um, that Mark uh, put forward there with the uh, E cubed. Uh, that I think we do need to simplify that process uh, and to come back to some sorts of basics. Uh, and forget about those um, uh, eternal issues of diet and mobility and evolution and so on, which will or always be there. I did go back, like Jonathan, uh, and uh, looked at my much-thumbed copy of the 1948 Survey and Policy of Field Research. It's a wonderful document, actually. Uh, the Paleolithic part was written by uh, K.P. Oakley, so it was written from great... Uh, authority. It's interesting looking at the whole document because uh, uh, very wisely it goes up to the Anglo-Saxon period and then stops. <laughs> uh, which, uh, we, um, so it just, it just shows you how inclusive uh, archaeology was in 1948. It also took about five years to come out, but I, I put that down to paper shortages after the, um, uh, after the war. Um, uh, we were all on rations then. Um, but um, uh, it's interesting looking at it, though, from the point of view of the Paleolithic through. Everyone seems to be asking the same questions. 
They all want to know um, uh, what the age of various things are, uh, but they've written this document without knowing that radiocarbon is just round the corner and is actually going to change their lives. Now, it took a long time to change the Paleolithic's life. It, it, it helped in the Mesolithic, and it obviously helped in the Upper Paleolithic, although we now know that all those early dates have to be thrown away. They're complete rubbish. Uh, but uh, they, um, uh, it didn't help what we heard about this morning for the uh, uh, lo uh, later middle Pleistocene and so on, uh, which has, has risen to prominence. Uh, and it, it seems to me that it was after that moment that there was this kind of fault line appeared uh, in archaeology generally, and certainly in uh, British archaeology, between those periods that could exploit uh, radiocarbon and be freed from the shackles of having to work out chronologies based on some inscription in Egypt and how you translated it across 3,000 miles into a Stonehenge or something like that. Uh, the sorts of things that Gordon Child was absolutely brilliant at doing. Uh, uh, and suddenly archaeologists were relieved of that very intricate kind of scholarship and they could start asking different questions. It took the Paleolithic a lot longer uh, to, um, to catch up, uh, but catch up we did. Uh, and I, I suppose one thing that has concerned me listening to the papers uh, this, uh, uh, today uh, is that there's, there's kind of just a little sense that we've lived through a golden age uh, and that we're seeing this golden age of, of uh, aggregates levy and AHOB and, all, and, and uh, many of these wonderful projects like Channel Tunnel and uh, the, the sites that went along with it, that we're seeing that kind of slightly slip off uh, into, the, into the past. Uh, and I don't think that's the case. I, I, uh, you know, golden ages are always a little bit of a, uh, a, little bit of a myth. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I, 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 don't, I don't feel that we should feel uh, embarrassed by our previous success. What we should do is build on that success and to take it, uh, to take it forward. I'm also a little concerned about the bunker mentality. Um, and uh, I noticed on uh, Mark's first slide that along with the venerable institutions of Oxford, Cambridge, Southampton, Royal Holloway, Durham, wherever, he also had Hogwarts. Uh, uh, it, it was up there in the middle of the slide. Um, uh, maybe uh, those at the back couldn't see it that well, but I could see it. And of course, the thing about Hogwarts is, you know, there are four houses. And obviously, the Paleolithic community would put itself in Gryffindor, uh, because uh, Gryffindor is always going to win. And, you know, if we were nasty, I suppose the Romanists would be in Slytherin or something like that. <laughs> but, but, you know, but, but my point is, my point is that we want to get rid of this kind of silo bunker mentality. Uh, you know, we're all interested in the past and in human history. So if I was being really controversial, uh, and I have written about this, uh, I would say that actually what we need to do is to get rid of some of this 19th century baggage that was invented uh, by Lubbock and uh, all these other great people, and that can certainly be uh, looked at in terms of the history of the subject, and terribly important it is. But in a sense, we're all studying deep history. Uh, we may study very deep history, uh, and the Neolithic people may study more recent deep history, but it's a seamless continuity of trying to tell the human story uh, through objects, through landscapes, through the environments that we can reconstruct, guided by some big principles such as evolutionary theory, in our case, uh, uh, but uh, you know, many other uh, uh, theoretical perspectives can be brought in. And for me, I think that we, we're a lot stronger if we're uh, actively taking down those barriers and talking to our colleagues, as many speakers have, have intimated, uh, and particularly uh, John um, was, was arguing that we should all go off and uh, dig on a Roman site or a, a, a Neolithic long barrow just to get the feel of what's going on uh, in those particular periods. And I think that that's absolutely right. And that, of course, is the genius 
of, the, uh, of our hosts today, the Society of Antiquaries, that not only embrace all of deep history, they embrace all of shallow history as well, uh, and there are heralds and uh, 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 all sorts of uh, 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 people interested in, in, uh, in antiquarianism as well. So that was, uh, that was one thought. I don't think we're at the end of a golden age. Uh, we're, we're, we're still riding uh, that particular uh, crest. So uh, I just had a few uh, other thoughts, though, which, uh, because we've got a couple of minutes before, so I'd be interested to hear what people uh, might think. And I'm going to call, I'm going to give him advance warning, but I'm going to call on my co-organiser to also say a couple of words, uh, if, if he would like to, uh, uh, towards the end. But what, have I take, what do I take away from today? Um, well, some of the phrases I've written down as we've been going along, uh, I think the key one is expect the unexpected. Um, but that's a, that's, that's a phrase which I think all archaeologists would subscribe to. You dig your Iron Age pit, you've got no idea what's at the bottom of it, you pray for a gold talk, uh, you end up you know, with a cereal grain. Um, but that's, that's, that's the way that uh, archaeology works. Uh, our unexpected is partly because we still don't quite understand the dimensions of the uh, Paleolithic uh, record because it is complex and it is difficult to sample and we're not yet sure that we've got a representative sample of what was there, a representative sample by landscape, by environmental type, by hominin, uh, uh, whatever it might be. And that, I think, goes along with what Nick was uh, talking about, uh, you know, that we've got these new worlds waiting to be discovered. And that, I think, is still the great intellectual excitement about the uh, Paleolithic, about the deepest of deep history, uh, that, that those worlds, they had to be imagined 150 years ago, and we're still imagining them. Uh, uh, and, uh, and then testing that imagination against hard evidence and data uh, to see uh, what, is, what is going on. Then we had a phrase from Francis, which I think uh, followed on from that. Uh, the Paleolithic is the same but different. But yes, that's true of all of archaeology. Uh, every period is the same but different. It has its own um, particular traditions and its own ways of, of, of working. Uh, my argument would be along that Hogwarts line that we, we, need, to, we, we need to work out the, the ways in which the Paleolithic fits in to the rest of human history. Uh, it may require rather different and specialist archaeological methods, but its position in human history uh, has to be guaranteed and has to be uh, put in there. So what else? Uh, a meeting like this we can all go away with a good feeling and so on. We can all get our copy of Lost Landscapes and have a glass of wine. But I think we need to move a little bit further on and to try and think about where we would want to take this and how we would want to use the energy generated in such a meeting uh, to best effect. And uh, these were just my thoughts uh, going along. Uh, and I think they chime with the historic England's um, agendas uh, under uh, the uh, aims uh, and uh, the strategic policies of Heritage 2020. And I noticed on Jonathan's um, uh, slides that they were, were fitting there. But I think we seem all agreed, and this is where I'd like a little bit of feedback, that um, uh, enhancing the HER, devising a mechanism by which the citizen science, by which our own uh, academic research, our own archaeological contract, grey literature, all the work that's going on that is finding materials actually gets into a central resource which can then help us understand about this deep past and which can help us um, in, inform the processes of planning and curating uh, uh, on a much more solid uh, footing. And uh, uh, that, I think, uh, is, is important. And I think one of the ways that that needs to be run alongside is, is something else that's kept coming back and back today, which is modelling the deposits in which we find. This is a, a really powerful tool. Uh, James raised the issue of GIS, and maybe 
Uh, we're not quite ready for the national GIS, although it would be great if we could have it. But this deposit modelling, and talking uh, to some of you in the uh, coffee breaks, uh, more along the lines of identifying, you know, the 50 wetland sites that are at most risk. Uh, we identify the 50 uh, 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 deep history deposits which are at most risk or at most potential, and then we can uh, uh, look, uh, look, look at those. Uh, so that was, one, uh, that, that was one thought. And how to do that, I suppose the scheme which has impressed me most is the Portable Antiquities Scheme, and flows were mentioned at, at one point. I think there's a model, uh, or not just a model, a framework which I think we could uh, uh, align ourselves with uh, much more closely, which gives us both public engagement, and this of course is why government is so keen to fund PAS, although maybe not quite at the levels that it deserves, but they are very keen uh, uh, with it. And Ed Vasey, uh, the minister, is always talking about PAS as being a shining example because it reaches parts of the stakeholder community that other parts of the heritage don't. Uh, and uh, 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 it seems to me that we have an even more ubiquitous uh, set of materials in lithics and whatever uh, to engage but uh, uh, I would like to hear more about that as a, as a, as a possibility. Uh, I think um, uh, revisiting John Wymer's great guidance, note, guidance notes is well overdue. And if, uh, uh, if Mark will allow me that, it's not a part of a research agenda, but I think that that sort of guidance does need to be redrafted. Uh, and uh, a group such as this, I think, is, is, is uh, uh, from this group, uh, it would be good to have that sort of uh, support that that's what needs to be done uh, and to find how it might then be disseminated uh, and uh, the revision uh, would be to go through, through that. So those were all the uh, thoughts that I had, but I just wondered if Matt would like to take this opportunity to say a few words or whether uh, he feels that uh, that's unnecessary. I always like putting uh, co-organisers on the spot. Thank you, Clive. I've not prepared a thing. I'm going to open my mouth and <laughs> we'll, see, we'll see what comes out. It's been, of course, a great pleasure to bring this meeting here to the Society of Antiquaries. And I think one of the exciting things about bringing it here is these are really, really challenging times for heritage protection and for archaeology in Britain, it looks as if they're going to get a hell of a lot more challenging as well. Nothing that we've seen within the past couple of years can give us any sort of succor or comfort that things are going to get great. Everything, I remember being a teenager, finding my first bag of flints in the field, taking it along to Andrew Woodcock. I don't know if Andrew's still in the room. Um, East Sussex County archaeologist and Andrew dutifully putting it into the HER going to the museum, seeing material that my great-grandfather collected. These are all knowns and constants that we grew up with, and if we're not careful, we're going to live to see all of these fixed points in the heritage landscape come under huge stress and maybe even disappear. Now, the Paleolithic is our tiny corner, and we're here fighting the Paleolithic, but I think we're only going to be strong if we join up the connections between all of these different periods into the wider narrative. For various reasons, it's not going to be in the individual university departments or the period interest groups. It's going to be those groups like the Society of Antiquaries, like the CBA, um, which have enough disconnection from the agendas, from the politics, from the creation or the implementation of policy to truly have a radical voice and say, no, enough, you know, this, this isn't going to work. Because no one else is actually speaking out, no one else has enough distance from self-interest to actually be able to make those calls. For our own part, in Paleolithic archaeology, one of our great strengths has been that as our discipline has transformed itself over the past, say, generation, 30 years, 40 years, it's allied itself so much more closely with quaternary science. We've benefited so hugely by working with geographers, stratigraphers, dating specialists, scientists, and we've managed to embed a part of archaeological practice very successfully within a scientific paradigm. 
And this is all to the good, and I'm not suggesting we change direction on that at all. But I do think, as someone who identifies, self-identifies as a Paleolithic archaeologist, we also need to reconnect nationally and maybe on a European level as prehistorians, as archaeologists, try and see that connectivity that actually reconnects the Paleolithic, not just with the Mesolithic, and God knows we have enough trouble there, but yes, with the Neolithic, <laughs> with the Bronze Age, with the Iron Age and beyond, and actually find those commonalities, not just in themes, not just in research questions, but in the fundamental texture of the landscape. How does the deep distribution of Pleistocene sedimentation translate right the way through into land use into medieval period. You can draw those lines, you know, Lurse deposits through the LBK to good preservation of medieval field systems. All of those lines are there, and we've got to be part of joining it up. It's only going to be by joined up we're actually going to achieve this. Um, I've learned a lot through our response in 2008 with um, you know, the, the crash of the economy, seeing the writing on the wall with the research, wondering how we're gonna pursue our own research agenda in developing a, pr a program research in Jersey, which was very much a response to that, and working together as a group with some other fantastic prehistorians and quaternary specialists, and thinking about how we can impact not just on research in a particular block of land that happened to be 10 by 5 miles in size, but also feeding into community archaeology, into evolving policy and protection, an ongoing, uh, an ongoing process. These kind of lessons have got to be played out now, I think, on a county by county, authority by authority basis. And it's only going to be by working together, by being more connected, by joining up those lines that um, we're going to be more effective. So, yeah, this is Paleolithic 2020, but, you know, this is prehistory and this is archaeology and we've got to be part of that bigger community too. So, thank you. Thank you, Matt, and uh, uh, rather like just a minute, we've now uh, filled up the time, uh, so we're, 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 we are uh, right at the, um, uh, at the wine reception moment, um, and uh, I think uh, it just remains for me to thank our hosts today, uh, in particular, uh, well, a general thank you to the Society of Antiquaries and to its council who approved this uh, uh, meeting and have funded it. Uh, but also, uh, in particular, to John Lewis, who gave us full support uh, when we came to him with this idea, uh, and to René Ladoux, who has been uh, indefatigable in organising it, keeping us to time, making sure we're fed uh, and coffeeed and so on. Uh, so thank you ex very much indeed for that. <laughs> And I'd just like to thank all our speakers who came today and, uh, and, and gave us such great papers and who uh, kept a time so admirably. That, in my experience, is something that could well be uh, passed on to other periods <laughs> in uh, archaeology. Uh, so thank you very much for that. But m more importantly, to all of you who've come and from your very diverse backgrounds, uh, have shown that the Paleolithic uh, is a very broad uh, tent uh, and uh, that we uh, uh, are open to all. So thank you very much indeed and outside is the wine reception.